I'd like to welcome you to another episode of You Can't Make This Shit Up. I'm your host, Joel Hoxley, with David Washington. We have a special guest uh, here today with us, and that's Commissioner Emily Bonilla. Uh, Commissioner, could you just introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, I am Commissioner Emily Bonilla, and I was elected first in 2016 and re-elected in 2020. Excellent. So... If it's okay if I call you Emily, I'm so used to calling you Emily, and it's just you know kind of like a little comfort level, and it's like a homecoming in a way. Um, tell us a little bit about what it means to be a commissioner. What it means, or like to me, or what does to it you, actually mean? Yes, <laughs> to you. Yes, yes. All right. Well, as a a county commissioner, the way I explain it is someone who manages the county, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the, you pay your taxes, the funding goes up to the federal level, goes to the state, and that money just trickles back down to the county and we manage how that money is spent um, to manage the county and everything you experience in the county. So the roads, utilities, just different things like that, right? Um, for me, what being a county commissioner means is that you're a representative of the people. So, you know, we say local government is closest to people and it really is. You know, um, like my neighbors know me, I know them and I represent them. You know, it's, it's that close. And everything that we work with, you know, affects their everyday lives. So it really is um, something that, you know, you really are closer to the people. Prior to your election in 2016, it was a, shocking year because I remember that night that you were one of the few Democrats who actually won. It was the year that President Donald Trump actually won against Hillary Clinton. And so there was a lot of long faces, but I remember you being on the stage at the Avalon Theater or? Um, the Abbey. Abbey, thank you. The Abbey Theater. And just this big grin on your face the orlando signal took a picture and it's just great and so i remember that prior to 2016 you were an advocate for and still are an advocate for the rural space the open space in district five can you talk a little bit about that yeah it's it's all about smart growth mm -hmm. and making sure that density goes where density should go and we preserve the conservation and environmentally sensitive areas and the rural lifestyles of the people living in the rural area. So you have the urban core and then the rural area. And by making sure that we are developing in a smart way and planning for that growth, we also preserve our tax dollars because if we continue doing suburban sprawl or urban sprawl, whatever you want to call it, um, which is like high densities out in the middle of nowhere, um, then you're wasting tax dollars because then you have to bring infrastructure out there and it's just wasteful. Well, my question is simply uh, a little bit more on, on the personal side. So how do you feel, you know, with term limits, uh, how, how, how are you going to rate your success as the county commissioner and before you make your choice on what you do next? Um, so I... I feel like I've accomplished so much. Like I, you know, I was looking, I was with someone, we were looking at my campaign website, right? And my, my literature from 2016 and like all the things that I wanted to accomplish and we were going through it, we were like, you accomplished all of it. <laughs> so it has been a success for these eight years. You know, what I set out to accomplish, I've been able to accomplish, which has been exciting. And a lot of it is coming to a head right now. You know, our last BCC meeting was just, you know, three of the items on that meeting was, you know, things that I was fighting for right. since 2016. It's just crazy how that journey has been. And, you know, I, my, my sister-in-law, um, her, her father had passed away. Um, he had dementia, so we knew it was coming, but, you know, I was at a meeting the next morning. I was like, it didn't matter who died. I was not going to be able to miss that meeting, you know, because it was just like the whole day was basically my agendas. So it's just, you know, been a sacrifice. Um, yeah. Definitely, you know, family, friends, my career has all been sacrificed in the last eight years. But the, re the return, the reward has been able to accomplish all those things. Excellent. Just to speak to those accomplishments, I mean, 
the last board meeting uh, was this past Tuesday, is uh, August 2nd. Um, there's three things that come to mind for me. And uh, the biggest would be, and I'd love to, for you to speak to all three, uh, the biggest one uh, would be the board approving the language for the rural boundary uh, amendment on the November ballot. It was a unanimous decision. And so that has to be quite the accomplishment. Yes, it was. And yeah. that's, you know, something I've been working since, you know, being a citizen, you know, we wanted for the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2018, you know, I actually tried to do a petition initiative, but in 2016, they had changed the rules for petition initiatives, making it almost impossible for me to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, we tried again in 2020 with the CRC, they didn't pick it up. Mm -hmm. And then again, and now 2024, they picked it up and then we're preempted yes. and then came back to the board. So it was, it's been definitely a, a battle trying to get Correct. that on the ballot and we finally got it. Correct. And uh, another issue would be Project 2050. I don't want to confuse that with 2025. It's <laughs> a lot of talk about that. That's, that's on a whole different level, but Project 2050, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's um, Vision 2050. Thank you, Vision 2050. And, you know, that that came up because of the land use development, um, Lake Pickett North, Lake Pickett South, the Grow and Sustany. Correct. That was happening when I was elected, and that created so much controversy. And, you know, it was like between the people and the board and the developers, you know, just this whole battle, right? Mm -hmm. And so Mayor Jacobs at that time was like, we can't have this happening anymore. We need a plan so that people know and they're engaged in how their neighborhoods are gonna grow and what's, could, what they want it to look like. So that's when Vision 2050 like really started. Um, again, that's another thing that's like eight years, right? Right. Um, we're at a point where, um, I mean, I hope we make it to the end of it, but I'll just say things aren't looking really good for it right now. Okay. Um, and I, it's more, it's more now it's like between the staff and the commissioners, like we want this and they're like pushing for what they want. And we'll stop. We're the ones who make the decision, but you know, we, we, we need, really need them to edit it and amend it to match what the commissioners want so that we can actually have something that we're proud to vote on and, I think it's October okay. that we'll be voting. All right. um, one of the issues that kind of go under the radar is um, the water situation in Wedgefield, a community in East Orange in District 5. It seems to be a little movement towards some type of solution. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah. I mean, we haven't gotten to the point where we're, we've, you know, solve the problem. Correct. Um, the problem won't be solved for years, but it's taken years even to get to where we are now. Mm -hmm. um, before I was elected, there wasn't really any movement at all, you know, and when I started running for office in 2016, that community saw an opportunity where, okay, we have this commissioner who basically had run in 2012 for for eight years and then came back for two years and then four years and there's running for another four years. I mean, he's been almost a commissioner for like forever yes. in Orange County in yes. that district five. And they got no attention from him to solve their problem of the utility, water utility company out there, you know, is high prices, um, bad quality water, old sewage systems, you know, just the whole system was from the 1960s, you know. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, maybe over time some parts have been changed, you know, but, you know, it's just not at, in the condition it should be to provide good customer service, good quality water. Um, and they were paying way too much for it. Oh, yes. So when I started coming into the race in 2016, it was their opportunity to be like, either you help us or we're electing someone else. And so then the commissioner at that time was like, okay, well, I'll have staff look at it. Now he was trying ah, to do something, right? Yes. A little too late, right? Um, so then I came in office and, you know, really pushed the board to do something. Mm -hmm. The only solution really is for the county to purchase it or a government entity to purchase it. 
because the private utility, I mean, I don't think any utility company should be private, first of all. Like that's, a, I just, that's not something that I agree with. Sure. Um, and this is one of the, and it, this example here shows you why, <laughs> you know, because they're all about their profits. You know, that's their full concern, where if it's a uh, government, the quality and making sure our people are healthy is the concern, not the profits. And mm -hmm. we're at the point now where um, we got all the data, a majority of the data that we need. Now we really know the condition of the facility, how much it's going to cost. And now I have to go back to the people and be like, this is a lot of money. <laughs> you know, like how much are you willing to to I've, pay you know i've seen the numbers yeah and yes it's it's pretty high thank you and i i know that the in in the latest news reports that i've read uh i know that they're willing to start a conversation about how much they're willing to sell the plants yeah its assets to the county yes and um but like you said it it could be costly yeah, and I did get them already to commit in writing like a, a starting point, which is between 21 to $23 million. Mm -hmm. So at least we got that, you know, to start off with. So to speak to, uh, to water and water quality, it, I'm, I'm a Seminole County resident, and I'm on the conservative side, so I will be the one who will say the quality of water in Winter Springs is absolutely corrupt right now because they instead to try to keep taxes low and to keep their jobs in government they allowed it to uh it, they allowed to kick it the can down the road and now they have terrible quality on water that if it was owned and i'm not i'm not advocating for uh privately owned i'm just saying if that was privately owned that would not have happened per se so how do you balance that in in, in what you just uh, accomplished and i and i again not taking sides here because I think this is a political, you know, problem, not a not a uh, community problem. Yeah. So what you saw happen in Winter Springs, it's happening on this private utility. They continued increasing the rates, saying that oh, we need to make all these improvements. It's going to cost us this much. Going to the Public Service Commission, who are the ones who over have oversight over whether they should increase the rates or not, and. They increased rates, but they didn't do all the maintenance they were supposed to do with that increased rate. And according to, I guess, the Florida statutes of the way it works, they have to make a certain amount of pro profits. Mm -hmm. And so their excuse is, well, now we have to fix this, so we're going to have to raise the rates. Now we have to fix this, so we have to raise the rates. But when Orange County went in to do their assessment, they really didn't, they saw what they call delayed maintenance. Like things weren't being maintained the way it should have been. Yeah. So they're making their profits, making more money, but it wasn't going back into the facility. Uh, however, with Winter Springs, they didn't raise the rate. They didn't raise the taxes. They didn't reach out to developers to develop another tax base because the residents are satisfied in being what they call a bedroom community uh, uh, so they don't reach out and they don't annex so the, it's the same type of problem with with the government trying to keep the citizens happy they didn't raise the rates when they should have so it's so, it, again I see exactly the balancing yeah. act and I don't know how winter springs works if they work differently than Orange County but in Orange County no taxpayer pays for the water utility because Orange County has its own water utility company, but the taxpayers don't pay for it. The customers pay for it. So all of the cost of that utility is paid by the people using it in their water bill. So it doesn't affect the taxes of Orange County residents. Um, but the rates, so if there's a, a large um, capital improvement project that needs to be done, that comes out of the rates that the customers are paying. And so I don't know Winter Springs how that works. Like if they had maintenance, they should have raised the rates. And you have to keep up with the maintenance. If you don't, then it's gonna be oh, a I'm, huge bill. 
You know, like that's it's better to keep up with it than to just like and, and kick it down the road, and, and then all of a sudden you have this big right. And that's exactly, and, that, and that's exactly what's happening. So again, it's it's the same thing. But do you believe in the? Do you believe in? Uh, are there successful uh, private uh, and government, uh, you know, partnerships? I've, you know, it depends on how you look at it, but I do not believe that there are, if you look at the bigger picture. And I say that, so in Winter Springs, what could have happened is that the residents could have went to their local elected officials and be like, you have to fix this. Um, they have that control. With the situation we have now with the private utility, they don't have that control. So there's no oversight, but any... They have no control at all yeah, I, over it. Yeah, I think I misspoke. It, do you see any success for, successes in private and government uh, solutions when they work together? Like, are there oh, certain together, projects? Oh, together, still no. Certain projects? I say still no, and I say okay. this because you know we look at um, when I think of like um, Florida Power okay. or Duke Energy, right? That's sort of like a, a well, they're private, but you know they you know we give them easements or whatever but it's it's mostly private um i don't know if anywhere it's like totally you know like a partnership uh, it's either private or public um but even with that private one what happens is that they go to tallahassee and they lobby them to benefit themselves so if we didn't have that we would have like we're in the sunshine state and we're behind in solar energy. And it's all because of these companies lobbying Tallahassee mm -hmm. to make it more difficult for there to be a, an expansion of solar energy because they want to control it. So Florida Power, for instance, they're having these huge solar farms that they're building, right? Yes. And they're like, oh, we support solar energy because of all the solar farms are doing, but they control that. Imagine if every single household had solar power on their homes. We wouldn't need solar farms taking up our conservation lands and our agricultural lands. You know, like Orange County right now is looking to use um, stormwater ponds for space to put solar panels on so we're not using up land and wetlands and agricultural lands for it. Um, but you wouldn't need that if we had better legislation to, to encourage, you know, rooftop solar panels because right now like in other states you know you have rooftop solar panels on your home and you actually get paid for the excess energy going right, back right. onto the grid mm -hmm. that's not allowed here in florida because of the lobbying in tallahassee so commissioner the speak a little bit about that uh you brought up tallahassee a couple of times and also preemption and uh, the preemption of home rule. Uh, can you speak to how that may have hampered some of the projects that the commission maybe has looked at that, like for instance, the rural boundary, mm -hmm. so to speak, uh, but can you speak to how preemption has been helpful or not so helpful? <laughs> I don't know any instant, of any instance where it's been <laughs> helpful. Um, you know, I, it's not that I don't agree that there should be some statewide laws. You know, I think if there if it's something that affects every single county equally, right? We need a statewide regulation to regulate that because it's just easier. But if it's something that is unique for every single county, it's best to leave that to the county as a regulation. You know, so I think anything um, that is local economics, you know, that affects the local economy should be handled by the county because every local economy in every county is different. But let's say there's something that um, affects the, the, the state with economics, um, let's say like international trade, then perhaps that's something where the state could look at regulating. You know, so it depends on what part of that, you know, um, like the topic of economics, you know, what part of it, how does it affect the, states and the, the state and the county? you know, and who should deal with that regulation. Um, rent stabilization was There's one, one. Yes. That, I, that I initiated that one, right. and, you know, and 
every county is different when it comes to to rents and landlords and all that that's really local because we all have different economies we all have different wages wages is another one mm -hmm. that should i feel should be county rather than state only because all of our economies are also different when it comes to wages so in orange county it's more expensive to live than in one of the rural counties you know smaller rural counties in florida so you know why should they have the same wage like i yeah i mean i don't think they should both have the same wage i mean because it's different um so that's something i think should be county rather than state rental you know in control of the rents and that kind of those kind of laws i think should be the county um sorry did i misspeak with the wages i meant it should be county minimum yeah okay. it, it should be minimum wages. Yeah, minimum wages should be counties not state okay. um and I know where corporations come in and they're probably like, oh, that's too confusing, you know, because, but corporations, they're not all over the state for the most part, unless you're looking at McDonald's, <laughs> you know, and they can't adjust, right? Um, so, yeah, so that's where, that's how I feel about preemption and, you know, state laws versus county laws. So. Well, McDonald's would be individually owned. They the, 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 franchise, the franchise, they're franchises. So individually, yeah. so individually, they would have to adapt and overcome. So it's just like most people don't realize your BP, just because it says British Petroleum on it, it's not owned by somebody in Britain. It's probably owned by somebody as local as you and I. So Yeah, and to show you how they could adjust. So, you know, I'm terming out, so I've been looking at job hostings, right? Um, a lot of the, the remote jobs... Okay. They will pay you based on where you live and the cost of living where you live rather than, you know, rather than where they are. Right. You know, so, which I don't think is fair either. It's like, just because I live in Florida and not California, I think I should still get the same, I was doing the same work, just as qualified. I should get the paid the same as the people in California. Well. That, that's interesting because this morning I this morning I was on UCF. I paid th uh, three dollars and seventy cents for my cup of coffee instead of the three eighteen I would have paid in uh, Seminole County, at my local uh, at my local uh, Dunkin' Donuts. So, okay, that's your federal dollars being fed into the uh, student loan process going to the Dunkin' Donuts. That's uh, control. Listen, I'm just joking. I I'm having fun with this. I, I literally, I love what you're saying, totally disagree in my, my conservative value you know, ways, but I, I, I love the fact that you're open and, 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 and just express it so well. Um, really what I want to get at is you have so many different, Orange County is so different, in, even in each one of your districts, and you run as nonpartisans here in uh, Orange County, unlike us that we run uh, partisan races and it is countywide. Mm -hmm. uh, speak, speak to that uh, because your replacements are, don't have to get anything, your replacements are running and uh, what, what is it that you want to hand them when you say, look, no matter who it is, this is what I've accomplished, but this is, might be something that I would like you to take on in the future, if possible. Yeah. Um that's a very interesting question because I've been thinking about that. Um, and I was like, either the next person is going to have nothing to do because <laughs> I've accomplished everything that I set out to, um, or they're going to be super busy because my district is so diverse and has so many different issues. Mm -hmm. um, but the issues that they have have been there. They're going to continue being there. Um, it's mostly like... Um, like poverty, homelessness, um, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, as, far, as far as the smart growth, if we we're successful with Vision 2050, that would hopefully be solved before I leave. So, you know, really I'm, I'm setting the stage where everything will be solved by the time I leave. I just don't want someone coming in and messing it all up. Sure. Sure. <laughs> to undo everything that has all the hard work that has been done that would be my only fear is the wrong person coming in and undoing everything um yeah 
you mentioned life after being commissioner, and to hear you say you're looking for a job, is there a political future out there for you? Not for 2024. <laughs> I'm not running it for anything in 2024. I'm definitely looking for a two-year break um, at minimum. Uh, so 2026, I don't know. I'll just put it that way. Oh, oh, oh. No breaking news. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> I can't wait till you get to your your gotcha question. Oh, I got a good question. Look, my my last question, my my last question is going to be: You have everything from UCF uh, Christmas all the way over to uh, Maitland. Maitland. Uh, I want to talk about your relationship with the cities. Uh, That Mm -hmm. just to close out, what I want to talk about is: What is your relationship with the cities, and and how do you see that partnership for the eight years that you've served? Yeah, I I I. Wish I could say I, I would like it to be better. Um, so, you know, I have a good relationship with Winter Park. Um, Maitland, you know, I've reached out to them, tried to make meetings, but they're just, it never happened. You know, um, some of their constituents, you know, reach out to me with problems. I'm like, yeah, you know. Got to go to your city council, you know. That's true. Um, let, me, let me help. A lot of people don't realize that because when I work for Congressman John Micah, I can't tell you how many times somebody would call me and I would have to send them to the state representative. So I, I totally understand that situation. What she's talking about right now is there are issues that are in your city that the county can't touch. And it, it's heartbreaking for the commissioner at that point but it has to go back to the city. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want the audience to really clearly understand that there's a difference and there's limits to some things that you could get accomplished. Yeah, and I've reached out to them myself, you know, to try to talk to them about the issues that their constituents are coming to me about. Um, It's just, you know, I don't want to push too much either because it is their jurisdiction and I don't want to overstep, you know, so I try to at least, you know, share with them Um, and my staff too will send people to them you know if it's in their jurisdiction and you know the city of Orlando you know the pandemic happened and after the pandemic I actually saw Buddy Dyer in in a in a place and he didn't even recognize me (laughs) that's that's Buddy (laughs) yeah Yeah, so I was like all right Yeah, the relationship probably could be better. Yeah, that, that sounds like Mayor Dyer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yes, yeah. that's a different oh, story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, and I, again, with the city, other um, city commissioners of Orlando, I try to send them issues in their districts and their jurisdiction as well. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, that's about it. I usually the wrap up the interview i i usually have a um a gotcha question that really isn't a gotcha question <laughs> but it's something a little bit more personal about our interviewee so mayor bonilla <laughs> <laughs> commissioner tell us about emily tells all your podcast and uh, when can we do a collaboration oh that would be cool yes um so Emily Tells All was was started because there's just um, people in the community who don't know mm-hmm. all the services that Orange County provides or the nonprofits that we work with, what they provide. So it was an opportunity to help market and promote some of those agencies to the people, to the public, and in a fun way. You know, I thought a, a podcast or a talk show, it's, it's a talk show. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's a talk show, but it's like a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, both. it's yeah, yes. yeah. So it's it's just you know, I put like little games in there just to try to get you know people engaged. Um, I'll tell you that it's been hard to get viewers because people really are interested in hearing about government. Um, they want to see entertaining stuff. You know, they want to yeah, see people true. like dancing or whatever yes. crazy thing that they might be doing. So, you know, it definitely is a hard niche to, yes. to get viewers. Right. It, it, we found that, you know, some of our more popular podcasts or episodes are, are the ones where 
you know, we touch on the issue that, you know, either everyone is aware of and just want to, you know, hear a different perspective or hear what our perspective is or just jump into the fray or something that folks are typically not familiar with. And they're like, oh, wow, okay, let's talk about this. I'm going to help you. Riding with Emily and you take him on a trip with you in the, uh, in the animal control and then you take him, go on a, a, a police you know, police chase and you can go in the net. Listen, they'll be interested in government. There's a lot of things that be interested in government. They just don't want to talk about the things that we talk about. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah, I, 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 I did, <laughs> I went to animal control. We did that one. Um, you know, one of the most popular ones is, what is it? It's the, um, I have a couple of most popular ones. One was with um, Canine Companions. Nice. Okay. But it was here, we had the dogs, I think because the dog is like on the, the um, what's it, thumb, the thumbnail, right? Nice. And that's, yeah, everyone's, that's a hook. you know, you get a, a dog oh, on a yeah. thumbnail and they're yeah. clicking. Yeah, um, yeah. So we have that one that's the most popular. Another one was, um, oh, I can't remember, it's like an Irish sport. So I went out there and interviewed them. So we've done some on location ones. Um, the, the, this season though, for the most part is in the office and the next season you can see mostly in the office because we were just like running out of time and stuff. Sure. And so, you know, just had to get, get the content. Right. We'll, we'll love to do a collaboration and talk it up and market it and, you know, come up with a interesting topic or two or five. And you think waste management will let us, uh, do garbage for a day? <laughs> sure. After what I did in Illinois about 30 years ago, I, I think I'm on their hit list, but that's a different story. So, Commissioner, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, again, this is like a homecoming for me. I started politics here in Florida with your campaign in 2016, and here we are, what, eight years later, and uh, it's just kind of come full circle. So, I, you, you have been the spark to my political career here in Florida. So I really appreciate it. You and Mel and opening up your family, your home to me. Um, it wasn't what I was expecting to do when I came here to Florida, uh, but our mutual fan, friend, Wendy Wallenberg, I, shout out to Wendy. Uh, she introduced us and uh, the rest is history. Yeah. So I really appreciate it. Is there any closing words that you have for our viewers and listeners? Um, stay engaged. You know, one of the, one of my goals too, when I was running for office was that community engagement. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I guess I've accomplished that too. Cause like, you know, the mirror's like, darn, she wants something done. She's going to fill up this, this chamber here with people. <laughs> 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 That's how I get stuff done for the community. That's right. You have to show up. Yes. Um, so it's very important for the community to stay engaged. Um, and so I just, you know, watch Emily Tells All. Learn, yes. you know, watch this podcast. You have to learn about what's going on so you could stay engaged and come to the BCC meetings, talk about your opinions, your views of what we're discussing so that we know. Um, we don't know what we don't know. So if you're having issues in your community and you just expect us to just fix it, we probably don't even know it's happening unless you come and you tell us. Indeed. So you have to share your, you know, share your opinions, provide feedback to your elected officials. Well, I just like to tell you guys, like you have just watched another episode of you can't make this shit up. Uh, we want you to like, we want you to share, and now we want you to partner and, and watch another podcast because we just want you to have your entertainment and understanding of local government first. It's local first and then it's state. So like, share, and comment, and David's going to take us out of here. Yes. Please, we'd love to hear your comments. Bring your facts, not your feelings. We love to respond to everyone who does reach out to us. We want to thank you again, Commissioner. This is Commissioner Emily Bonilla. Orange County Commissioner, District 5, here in Central Florida. We really appreciate it. We'll see you the next time. This is You Can Make This Shit Up with Joel Hawksley, David Washington, and Commissioner Emily Bonilla. We're out.